Perhaps you're familiar with the story of Icarus. With a set of wings built by his father from feathers and wax, the young Greek became the first mortal to fly through the sky. But despite the warnings, he got too close to the sun. The wax holding his wings together melted, and he tumbled to his death. Fast forward thousands of years later. The year is 1973, the place, Southern California. Humans still dream of flight, and although airplanes are now a reality, there's still something tantalizing to the idea of being able to fly at will just like Icarus did. And that dream, or myth, is now embodied by the flying car. Inventors Henry Smolinski and Harold Blake had attended aeronautical engineering school together, and they both shared that very dream to build a flying car. Unlike other flying car prototypes, the two friends didn't start from scratch. They instead combined the body of a Ford Pinto and the wing and tail of a Cessna Skymaster to create the AVE Mazar, named after a star in the Big Dipper. The maiden flight was successful. Although the engine failed at low altitude, the pilot landed safely. For a follow-up flight, the test pilot was unavailable. Smolinski and Blake decided to fly the Mazar themselves. During takeoff, the Pinto separated from its wings, just like Icarus. The two men tumbled to earth, dying upon impact in a fiery crash. Is there any concept that represents our idea of the future and fantasy as much as the flying car? From Star Wars airspeeders to Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, from the Jetsons to James Bond, flying cars have captured our imagination but failed to translate into any sort of reality. Will flying cars ever be safe and practical enough to happen? Who would use them, and to what end? Can advancements in battery tech and autopilot modes actually get us there? That's today, or tomorrow, or maybe never, on Pass Gas. Pass Gas Podcast! It's about cars, it's not about ports! So I want to give a big shout out to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Look, something you might not know is that Valvoline is the original motor oil. What does that mean? Well, they were actually the first to patent motor oil over 150 years ago. And since then, they haven't stopped innovating. They've had a lot of firsts in the industry, to say the least. Like the first high mileage motor oil, the first synthetic blend, and the first racing oil. And since then, they haven't stopped innovating. They're constantly reinventing their formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every single engine on the road. In fact, every single Valvoline motor oil has been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. Industry's like, hey, we got these standards, you gotta stick to them, and Valvoline's like, no, we're gonna go above and beyond. Every Valvoline motor oil is proven to maximize engine life by targeting the main four causes of engine breakdown. What are those, you ask? Well, they're heat, friction, wear, and deposits. And there's another reason that we love Valvoline over here at Pass Gas. And that's because they're synonymous with some of the best racing legends in the last 100 years. We're talking Kill Yarborough, Mark Martin, AJ Foyt, and the NASCAR Cup champion Chase Elliott, as well as our friend Chris Forsberg. That's an all-star cast. What is this, the Expendables? So do yourself a favor and choose Valvoline. Head over to Valvoline.com slash original to find the perfect oil for your engine. Thank you, Valvoline. Now this is pod racing. <laughs> <laughs> what's your uh, What's your favorite flying car from uh, film or or books? If you're a smart boy, ooh, uh, I like the the Blade Runner flying cars. Mm, yeah, which one? Uh, specifically the one that Ryan uh, uh, the gauze. The one that the gauze uh, <laughs> flies in Blade Runner twenty forty nine is very sick. That's a good one. Yeah, uh, I like the Fifth Element cab a whole oh, lot. Yeah, oh, classic. Perfect. Joe, I I love the cop car from Blues Brothers when it drives off the end of the highway and then somehow ends up like ten thousand feet oh. up in the air. <laughs> oh no, it was the Nazis car. You yeah. like the Nazis car, Joe? No, please don't take that out of context. <laughs> uh, I also like the uh, the the Malibu from Repo Man. Malibu's most wanted. Oh, from Repo Man. I love Repo Man. If you guys have never seen Repo Man, that's probably. Like The Matrix and then Repo Man are, are like my favorite movies. There's a bunch of movies from the early 90s that, you know, I've heard my whole life that I have never seen. Like, what was that one where they're stuck in a cube and they have to go from room to room? That would be Cube. Cube. That's a <laughs> that's a great one from that era. Cube's pretty good. It holds up. 
Welcome to Pass Gas, everyone. This is not a, a movie, cinema, television show. This is an automotive history podcast. Thank you very much for joining us, as always. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Hellraiser Joe Weber. Now this is podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh and the ghost face killer himself, James Pumphrey. I love movie, cinema, television. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a culture vulture. <laughs> uh, yeah, today we're talking about flying cars. I don't really have much else to say. I think we should just get right into it. I want to show you my mug before we start, though. Yeah, go ahead. It's really got me uh, pretty juiced right now. It says, you got this in a very... And it's about, a, uh, yeah. it's about a two quarts of coffee. <laughs> it's a very large mug. Before we begin, we don't usually do this, but like, if you're a regular listener of the show and you haven't subscribed or you haven't left a review for us uh, or told a friend about the show, we'd really appreciate that. We're trying to get more people into the past gas nation, you know, We're trying to get more people fired up over here. Tell your pilot friend about this episode. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's got a pilot friend, right? That's right. Everybody. If people from 100 years ago could travel forward in time to 2021, they'd probably be amazed to learn about technological innovations like the smartphone, gene sequencing, and online dating. <laughs> But they might be equally shocked to learn what we failed to accomplish, especially that well into the 21st century, we are still in a world without flying cars. Like we mentioned in the intro, on-demand access to flight has been a dream for humans for millennia. It's humiliating to be stuck on land like a penguin without even a handsome body that looks like a tuxedo to compensate. I, 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 I've always said that. It was genius inventor and future ninja turtle Leonardo da Vinci who really kicked off making our dreams a reality, all the way back in the 1400s. Da Vinci studied how birds fly and mocked up a plan for a human-powered flying machine, a design that foreshadowed the hang glider by centuries. I went to the Da Vinci Museum in Italy, and mm -hmm. this they had like a mock-up of this, I think, or maybe just a drawing, one of his drawings, but it's like... A helicopter type thing and it has like this oh yeah that spiral like, yeah spiral looking drill looking thing and you just can tell it's not gonna work <laughs> <laughs> fast forward to the industrial revolution and the first patent for a so-called aerial car was filed in 1857 by french sea captain jean-marie lebris he also referred to the design as an artificial albatross a metaphor with plenty of foreshadowing considering how an albatross around my neck is an age-old metaphor for a terrible burden. Again, another saying I say all the time. I never knew what it meant, and I was like, why does Nolan constantly say that? In every meeting, he's saying that. <laughs> Little did Labrie or his contemporaries know that the flying car would be an albatross for hundreds of inventors and manufacturers to come. Labrie's albatross was a 50-foot glider made of cloth and wood with curved bird-like wings and a system of pedals for the pilot to take off and steer. Underneath the glider component was a horse-drawn cart that would allow for the transport and launch of the vehicle, making the albatross the first ever flying car, or at least flying cart. Wait, does, so the horse gets, gets to fly too, or the horse just... <laughs> no, uh... no, it's like uh, he's the slingshot. So the, the horse is just running the kite. Yeah, so the owner's like, okay, this <laughs> yeah. is the last time I'm going to see my horse because I'm flying to France. <laughs> yeah, you have to get a new horse every time. <laughs> God, what an albatross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, finding the horse is, a, is the real albatross. <laughs> when it came time for a trial run, it was Labrie himself who would helm his creation, either a vote of confidence or a sign he couldn't find anyone else crazy enough to do it. According to eyewitnesses, Labrie instructed a driver to pilot the horse-drawn cart down a road straight into a headwind. So yeah, running the kite, like you said. The albatross achieved liftoff, rising to an estimated 300 feet in the air and dragging behind it the cart driver who had got snagged on a rope. <laughs> like Looney Tunes. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> the glider became the first aircraft to achieve a higher altitude than its liftoff point. But when Labrie would attempt to fly again, he crashed and broke his leg, apparently scaring him off the endeavor for good. No, he's so close. I mean, I, I relate, man. When I broke my collarbone, uh, not taking any flight on my BMX bike, I said, you know what? I don't think this is for me. <laughs> I'm not sick enough. Labrie's efforts kicked off an entire slightly goofy era of 
flying machines. Imagine one of those choppy montages from silent films with some ragtime piano accompaniment and you're not too far off. Of course, since cars were barely established at the dawn of the 20th century, the delineation between planes and cars was a lot blurrier than it is now. In fact, many pioneers in the field of aviation didn't even refer to it as aviation, instead studying, quote, scientific kite flying. <laughs> what a name. That's tight. <laughs> 1903 was a massive year, not for flying cars, but for airplanes themselves. It was the year of the Wright brothers' flight at Kitty Hawk, and although other inventors had claimed flight before then, the Wright brothers' efforts are still the best documented. History gives them credit for being first in flight. Shout out to North Kakalaka, that's where those boys are from. But the Wright Flyer, as their plane was called, shares little DNA with our idea of a flying car. It was a biplane powered by a small engine and had no wheels. Wheels, guys, are one of the main parts that you need to define a car. Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know if you, without that, it's a like a boat or a plane. <laughs> <laughs> to achieve liftoff, the lightweight craft was mounted on a sloping wooden track laid out on the Kitty Hawk sand that served as a launching mechanism. It couldn't even taxi, much less drive on its own. The same year of the Wright Brothers' achievement, a less famous inventor by the name of Tajan Vuai was at work. <laughs> <laughs> the same year of the Wright Brothers' achievement, a less famous inventor by the name of Tajan Vuya was at work on a design that could rightfully be called a flying car. Vuya was a Romanian lawyer. Flying cars was just a side gig, <laughs> but his efforts were still impressive. He named his prototype the Vuya One. Voya's Voya featured a complex <laughs> metal frame of tubular steel welded on top of a square frame supported by four bicycle tires, somewhat resembling a modern dune buggy. Although prevailing aviation science of the time incorrectly assumed that an aircraft required two wings for takeoff, Voya went with a single wing design, stating that he'd never seen a bird with more than a single pair of wings. You know, Voya brings up a good point. He does. That's a... Quite the clever albatross he brings up. <laughs> what Voya hoped to do that hadn't been done before was take off in an independent craft without any assistance. Unlike the albatross, which required a cart, or the Wright Flyer, which used a rail, he wanted to prove feasibility of independent takeoff. In 1906, with journalists watching, Voya drove his craft about 150 feet before ascending to a height of about three feet above mm. the ground. <laughs> That was when his engine gave out and the propeller stopped. Rio crash landed but was unhurt. The flight could be considered a qualified success, but it didn't have the same impact of the Wright brothers' increasingly bold flights. Well, hold on. Honestly, like getting three feet of elevation with only 150 feet of distance, it's pretty impressive for the time. I mean, yeah. Like that's impressive. less than a football field. You know? Mm -hmm. He's already getting off the ground. Props. <laughs> hey, that was his problem. The yeah. props. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we, uh, well, I wish we could give him props. Who <laughs> <laughs> probably could have got higher. <laughs> Comparing Voya's efforts to those of the Wright brothers gives us our first hint at why we now live in a world of flying planes and driving cars, but devoid of flying, driving plane cars. Even in the early days of flight, it was clear that the simplest design was a craft that was built purely for one task, flight. Inventors who incorporated a car-like design were hampered by the twin issues of complexity and weight. Keep in mind that lightweight, strong materials like aluminum and carbon fiber were not yet available. For any vehicle that was to attain mass production, it was clear that specialized design was crucial. For the time being, a hybrid vehicle seemed just out of reach. Hmm. Yeah, I think you just at this point, they had to work on one or the other. They're like... I got to take my kids to school. I'd love to, you know, spend more time on this plane car. But uh, little Vuya's got to go to Escuela. <laughs> <laughs> a liger is a lion crossed with a tiger. Or is it a tiger crossed with a lion? Along with the Vuya 1, there were plenty of early airplane designs that resembled cars. But what about cars that took cues from airplanes? It's no secret that planes influenced the design and aesthetic of cars over the decades, especially like during the jet age in the 50s and 60s. But there are also inventors who started wondering if incorporating aeronautic engineering into their automotive ideas 
could lead to a liger of transportation, the flying car. Ligers are like 12 feet tall. That's what? scary. Yes. When they stand when they... on their back legs. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's, still pretty, <laughs> that's still pretty crazy. Glenn Curtis was an early imaginer of such possibilities. He first gained fame for designing his own motorcycles, including a 40 horsepower V8 with no brakes that he drove at a mind melting <laughs> speed of 136 miles per hour in 1907. Whoa. That's, that's like a five horsepower per cylinder. Yeah, that's crazy. That's like a thousand miles per hour in today's speed, you know, yeah. after inflation. 40 horsepower on a m- motorcycle. Pretty, pretty big. With no brakes. No brakes. Curtis's combination of driving balls and inventing brains earned him a telephone call from the inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, who invited Curtis to collaborate. Together, they founded the Aerial Experiment Association with the stated goal of building, quote, a practical flying aerodrome or flying machine driven through the air by its own power and carrying a man. Success was quick with Curtis flying a record-breaking 150 miles in the prototype airplane that the association built. The plane was nicknamed Junebug. 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 Kind of like, kind of like Uncle June in The Sopranos. Have I mentioned that I have been watching it constantly? <laughs> Gabagool. Then... Curtis's next feat was building a plane he called the Hydro Airplane, the first water plane that could take off from either water or land. From there, the possibility of a hybrid car that could fly seemed tantalizingly close. After all, engineers had imagined a horseless carriage, and it had to become a reality. Was imagining a flying carriage really so different? I don't think so. The resulting concept was the Curtis Autoplane, marketed as an aerial limousine. Introduced at the 1917 Pan American Aeronautic Exposition in New York City, the Autoplane had a narrow aluminum body that resembled the shape of a roller skate with a blunt nose that housed the propeller. The wings were 40 feet in width and detachable, allowing removal after transitioning from air to ground. Much of the appeal to such a concept was to circumvent the rough, often muddy roads of the time. Multi-lane highways were as much of a vision of the future as flying cars themselves. While the autoplane was capable of flight and performed some brief hops in testing, its development was cut short by the onset of World War I just a couple months after its debut. The autoplane was dismantled and rebuilt into an experimental flying boat for military use. See, you take the wheels off a car, you got yourself a boat. You got a boat. Imagine how further we'd be along with technology and whatever if we didn't have to stop like every 10 years for war. It's it's a it's a weird cycle because, of course, military innovation uh, drives a lot of inventions through time. But um yeah, it would be cool to see less uh, machines not focused on killing people. Yeah. You know. It was while World War I was still being waged that the first actual United States patent for a flying car was granted to one Felix Longobardi. Longboard? Yeah. Felix Did that Longboard. guy invent the longboard? Yeah, he's, uh, he's uh, started Sector 9. <laughs> <laughs> This being wartime, his proposed vehicle was designed for fighting and actually promised three modes of use, driving, flying, and boating. Although it was far-fetched from the start, it set off a wave of inventors patenting their flying car concepts. It's estimated that as many as 1,800 such patents have been filed in total, but Longobardi's was the first. I love that name. Felix Longobardi. Felix Longobardi. I'm Felix Longobardi, and I long to party, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and then he skates off in the on the boardwalk. On a nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got flip flops on. <laughs> he's like carving really hard. <laughs> Marcel Layat, a Frenchman, was a prime example of plane tech going into cars in 1922. He built a car named the Helica that used propellers to drive the car. Yeah, Helica. Basically, Helica. imagine a mini submarine on wheels mounted in the front with a massive hovercraft-like blade encircled by a circular band of steel. It looked like a death trap, but a fun death trap at that. As author Andrew Glass puts it in his book, Flying Cars, in the 20th century, quote, In 1906, flying machines and driving machines were not yet understood to be separate transportation technologies. 
But the difficulty of actually constructing a flying and driving vehicle led most pioneering aeronautical engineers to abandon the idea of a unified machine and to pursue the airplane as a separate mechanical entity with its own aerodynamic requirements. Yeah, I couldn't imagine a propeller to be that efficient for a car. Plus, no, like, definitely not. You think pop-up headlights are dangerous for pedestrians, like a propeller? <laughs> yeah, this thing basically looks like a reverse airboat with wheels. It's pretty cool. But like, how is that thing going to take off? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's it's pretty sick. There's no way. But Marcel uh, claimed to have gotten 600 orders for his propeller-driven car. Uh, so uh, that idea that uh, Andrew Glass laid out is a crucial one. Uh, that planes and cars didn't necessarily start as separate ideas. They're both ways to get around that could be the same way to get around. Think of the human body. Among the many tasks it can perform are walking and swimming, but we don't think of ourselves as a combination of a swimming animal and a walking animal. But when the concepts of planes and cars diverged, it seemed impossible for them to find a way back together. It was an easy enough thing to sketch on a page, but the limitations of early 20th century technology and materials meant that it was nearly impossible. Yeah. I think Ooh. that's uh that could be said about a lot of different industries like just focus on one thing and be good at it. Or like look at the appliance industry, for example. In the early 1900s, like yeah, they were trying to make TVs and refrigerators, but they didn't necessarily think of those as separate appliances. Yes. Yeah. And then they realized that they had to go separate ways. But now, nowadays, the technology is there. You can get a, a TV on your refrigerator. Guys, if you've been opting out of skincare, I understand. I didn't really care about my skin until, I don't know, last year, okay? It's just not really part of the male routine. And I think it's time for that to change. The truth is, like, most of you care about your skin. You just don't know where to start. If you're looking for something simple that works without being too complicated, then you have to check out this week's sponsor, Curology. Curology makes skincare effortless, okay? They create a custom skincare formula for your skin goals. That could be, you know, clearer skin, less oily skin, less dry skin, the works. Plus, they've got a cleanser and a moisturizer that's super easy on your skin and super easy to use. Don't even have to think about it. Everything ships right to your doors and your first 30 days are free. You just cover the five bucks for shipping and handling. Sign up for Curology in minutes by sharing your skin type and skin goals. And a licensed provider can create a custom formula made for you. That's right. One personalized formula that's all you, okay? Whether you're struggling with acne, like me, I still get zits. Every week, very annoying at 27 years old dark spots, or just want something simple and straightforward. They've also got some amazing products you can add to your subscription, like an acne body wash, which I will definitely be taking, emergency spot patches, so you can do it up nice or keep it simple. The sign-up process is super simple, just a few quick questions like, what's your current skincare routine? Do you have any medications? Uh, what is your skin actually like? Upload a few photos so that licensed professional can take care of you. It's very convenient, takes a lot of the guesswork out of going to the store. I still don't know what face soap I should be using. And it's also super easy to add to even begin a skincare routine. You just apply this stuff at night and it works while you sleep. Very easy for uh, busy people like you and myself. If you're ready for healthier skin and a routine that makes sense, do what I did. Give Curology a shot, okay? Go to Curology.com slash gas for a free 30-day trial. You just pay for shipping and handling. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash gas to unlock your free 30-day trial. See Curology.com for all the details. Thank you very much, Curology. A big thank you to our sponsor for today's episode, BetterHelp. What interferes with your happiness? Is something keeping you from achieving your goals? BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. That's right. BetterHelp connects you in a safe, private online environment. It's super convenient, and you can start communicating with a professional therapist in under 48 hours. This is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. It's super convenient. You can send a message to your counselor at any time and you'll get a timely and thoughtful response. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions perfect for this current work at home environment. So helpful right now. All without ever having to sit 
in an uncomfortable waiting room, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if the need be. You know, sometimes you don't find the right therapist, and that's okay. That's part of the process. You gotta, you gotta go through a couple to find the one that's right for you. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional online counseling, and financial aid is available, which is super great right now. The service is available for clients worldwide. Find the particular expertise you need online. Don't limit yourself to counselors located near you. They've got a bunch of licensed professional counselors who specialize in a bunch of different areas, expertise like depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief and self-esteem. And of course, anything you share with them is confidential. It's very convenient. And remember, BetterHelp is convenient, professional and affordable. If you don't believe me, check out the testimonials posted daily on their website. And remember, BetterHelp is not a crisis line. So many people have been using BetterHelp lately that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. And as a past gas listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash past gas. That's betterhelp.com slash past gas for 10% off. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health again. That's betterhelp, H E L P dot com slash past gas. Thank you, BetterHelp, for sponsoring this episode. After this age of pioneering in both cars and planes ended, flying vehicles stuck around. But instead of a vision of what could be possible tomorrow, they now entered the imagination as part of what could be possible in the future. Instead of developing something new, the idea was now hybridizing existing technologies. Big names started getting interested, chief among them Henry Ford, who had revolutionized car manufacturing at a massive scale. By the 1920s, Ford also became interested in the potential for flight. Ford figured the first step to a flying car was to repeat the same formula that he used with cars, specifically a mass market single seat aircraft called the Ford Fliver. Mm -hmm. Ew. Ew. <laughs> Fliver being a slang word for a cheap car at the time. One journalist was so excited by the prospect, he wrote a poem to celebrate the Fliver. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I dreamed I was an angel, and with the angels soared, but I was simply touring the heavens in a Ford. <laughs> Weak. Only one rhyme. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what a okay. dork. <laughs> Where is a dork? Like, <laughs> this just like this like reminds me of like it just proves that this mentality has been around for hundreds of years. Like you see people on Twitter that get like weirdly defensive of Elon Musk and Tesla, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. despite valid criticisms. Hey dude, Henry Ford is a genius, dude. He's a genius, man. I wrote He's a poem. A genius. <laughs> like imagine, like you don't even have to imagine that someone would write a poem about Elon Musk. You yeah. Know? I drove so quiet. My life no, <laughs> no longer a mess -la. <laughs> For I was behind the wheel of a, of a Model 3 Tesla. Model 3 Tesla. Oh. The, oh, my God. The Fliver was a plane, <laughs> not a car plane hybrid, but it still marked an important step in the progression of the flying car. However, after the vehicle's debut in 1927, the reviews were not kind. After a test flight, the most famous aviator of the time, Charles Lindbergh, didn't mince words, describing the humble Fliver. As one of the worst aircraft I ever flew. <laughs> Have you seen my baby? <laughs> After a test pilot died in a fatal crash, the project was scrapped. Still, Ford didn't abandon his vision. Quote, Mark my words. <laughs> the combination airplane and motor car is coming. You may smile, <laughs> but it will come. <laughs> he is like... That's a really good impression of Henry Ford. Thank you. I gotta say. The flipper heard, is actually, heard... <laughs> it's got a pretty cool design. It's like really short, but also it's got like a blue and silver Ford paint job. It's kind of sick, actually. You want to know how I built all these cars? <laughs> <laughs> Assembly lines. <laughs> I would be absolutely terrified to be in this plane. I would be absolutely terrified to be in any of the vehicles we have talked about thus far. <laughs> it wasn't until after World War II ended that flying cars reached their peak. Not in any sort of reality, but in the minds of a newly coined class of people. Consumers. 
The 50s were a decade where every household issue had a solution in the form of dishwashers, vacuum cleaners, and microwavable frozen entrees. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Uh, that's that's still, a, still a staple in my house. The future just didn't seem like a tangible thing on the horizon. To many, it felt like it had already arrived. Nolan, what's your favorite frozen dish, real quick? Uh, probably my state, my go-to is like El Monterey frozen bean burritos. Mm, those are good. Those are good. Yeah, those are. The, I mean, that El Monterey is by far the best frozen bean burrito brand wow. out there. And they don't even um, sponsor us. You just straight up. They don't. Them. I'm just a huge fan of them. Uh, I even one of my cars in iRacing, racing, I commissioned a a a El Monterey paint job. <laughs> so if you see if you're if you're running the uh the the gander series the gander truck series uh you'll you can see me out there with that el monterey paint job uh anyway anyone else feel like it's really hard to lose weight <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you're <laughs> being funny, but you're, a... you're just talking about eating burritos and playing video games. No, he he knows. <laughs> Flying cars fit neatly into this Jetsons-like atmosphere. The war had also led to massive strides in aeronautic technology. Air travel was transitioning from a luxury for the very wealthiest to something accessible to, if not everyone, at least the upper middle class. Perhaps no aero car better emblemized this optimistic, newly affluent age than the Convair Car 118. It was designed by Theodore P. Hall, who had cut his teeth designing a pre-war hybrid called the Rotable Airplane. During the war, he had been a senior member of a team that designed the B-24 bomber nicknamed the Liberator, which holds the record for the most produced bomber in military history. Great aircraft. Ah, oh, dude, the, oh, the Liberator is so cool, man. Yeah. I know. I, I want to get, like, I never will be this rich, but it's my dream to be, like, World War II airplane rich. Like, As like, long, okay, like Harrison James, Ford. Like yeah, as Ford. long as you, you, you can own the airplane, I will highly discourage you from riding in said airplane. Why? Because, the dude, vintage air, World War II aircraft go down. Harrison Ford crashed his plane twice. That's <laughs> why. <laughs> twice. I guess so. Yeah, I'm, he's all right, though. People die in these bombers all the time. How much do F-14s cost? Uh, <laughs> more than you can afford, pal. Pal. I know. Grumman. Uh, its high point was a feature in a 1946 issue of Popular Mechanics, kicking off decades of the magazine featuring flying car designs. The second you see a picture of the Convair car, it's easy to see why the editors of Popular Mechanics covered it. Yeah, it's goofy. Oh, this is the classic. Yeah. I'm really surprised that it can fly. It looks very heavy. <laughs> it looks like a... <laughs> really terrible Photoshop. <laughs> the aircraft appears to be a 50s era black sedan with a small silver propeller plane simply bolted on top. We're not exaggerating. Uh, imagine a plane trying to make a baby with a car and you're literally spot on. What you imagine is the car. Kill me. <laughs> I don't. I shouldn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> After landing, the car could uncouple from the wing and propeller and the roof of the car could then close. And the Convair was simply a coupe, albeit one with a very bizarrely shaped teardrop body to help with the aeronautics while flying. Very cool. The idea was to market the plane to a promising market. Military veterans with flying experience who would be drawn to the convenience of both owning a car and a plane in one fell swoop. Unfortunately, the Convair Model 18 was not destined to have the success of the B-24. Although Hall's plan was to manufacture 160,000 of these things, only two of them were ever made. It's not even close. They did not did not get there. The reason was one common among such prototypes, a crash that gave investors cold feet. Despite its failures, many were inspired by the modular design of the vehicle, with automotive historian Andrew Glass calling it, quote, B-24 
beautifully designed and functional, as well as, quote, the most promising venture yet to mass produce a flying automobile. The Convair kicked off a wave of Buckminster Fuller-like prototypes that inventors envisioned could be parked in the everyman's garage, literally. One inventor self-published a book to promote his invention with the title, An Airplane in Every Garage. With names like Airphibian, The Plane Mobile, and The City Hawk, most concepts seemed more sci-fi than realistic. And while technological advancements meant that operational prototypes were increasingly commonplace, it was unclear how these prototypes would ever reach mass production. There were and are multiple barriers to flying cars reaching consumers. The engineering component has always seemingly been the most surmountable. Successful prototypes have existed for decades, proving flying cars were possible, if not practical. The constant technological progress of the 20th century, humans reached the moon, damn it, also made inventors and the public believe that a flying car was an achievable goal. Still, there was that nagging question of practicality. Prototypes looked cool and could even achieve the task of flying and driving, but how did they fit into the actual lives and routines of people? Designers juggled the trade-offs in design, but it was hard to imagine any prototype transcending novelty and becoming a practical means of transportation. As cool as it is to have a vehicle with detachable wings, at some point, it's just easier to own both a car and a plane. I mean, that's what I do. <laughs> Which brings about another issue, costs. While inventors promise savings when the vehicles were made at scale, prototypes usually cost millions of dollars to make, meaning it would actually be more affordable to own a car and a plane rather than just a single vehicle. Hmm. Another issue that is more of a concern in today's age of climate awareness was the environmental component. Flying vehicles create huge amounts of emissions, not to mention noise pollution. Airplanes solve this by locating airports in industrial areas or around poor people, keeping issues at arm's length. But if flying cars were to become a neighborhood staple, the problems would be obvious. Imagine your neighbor mm -hmm. taking off yeah. in their driveway every morning at the crack of dawn. Just like idling for 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 Eclipsing all of these concerns, however, was the question of safety. Driving cars is kind of hard. Piloting a plane is really hard. One can only assume that a flying car would add layers of complexity that would make safely pilot driving one really, really hard. Adding to that risk, any of the urban or suburban areas where flying cars would theoretically be used are much, much more less controlled than an airport. We don't really think about it, but an airport has dozens of complex safety measures, including an air traffic control tower, safety lighting on the ground personnel, and emergency response procedures. Yeah, I mean, there'd be so many crazy crashes if everyone was just flying and driving. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine just like, I don't want to be an ageist, but like just an old lady, like flying at like 40 miles an hour. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like 25 feet above the <laughs> above the street. I mean, okay, I see I see crashes near my place uh probably every three weeks someone gets T boned. Uh jeez. So I can only imagine what living under like there there would have to be like concessions made for like sky lanes or something like that. Yeah. Like if someone crashed got T boned in the sky and then now you have two wreckages falling <laughs> to earth onto someone's house. Uh, yeah, I'm just not not a fan. With all these concerns, it's easy to buy into the argument that flying cars are the vehicular version of vaporware, a product that is constantly in the process of being designed or manufactured, but never quite seems to come to fruition. The mirage-like status of flying cars is just as real today as it was 100 years ago. The perfect example is a 2018 YouTube video with nearly 10 million views simply titled, World's First Flying Car About to Go on Sale. The three-minute video shows a futuristic silver and black CGI car labeled the TFX pulling out of a CGI suburban garage. While uplifting string music plays, the wings unfold and turn into twin helicopter blades before the car takes off into the horizon. Update, it's 2021 and the TFX is still not for sale, but that didn't stop 10 million people from momentarily buying into the fantasy, and you know what, I don't blame them. The TFX embodies the modern vision of a flying car, which is to think of the car as a hybrid of a helicopter 
not an airplane. This class of flying vehicles is referred to as VTOLs, which stands for Vertical Takeoff and Landing. While engineering challenges remain for the development of this class of vehicles, it seems as if a major hurdle may soon be surpassed. The emergence of lighter weight, more powerful batteries that could allow for fully electric VTOLs a necessity considering the excessive emissions of any flying vehicle powered by fossil fuels, as well as noise concerns. As flying cars seem more reachable, there's also a class-based argument developing against their production. After a Morgan Stanley analysis predicted that, quote, on-demand, short-distance urban air travel could top $850 billion by 2040, American progress slammed the unequal future that was predicted, quote, Unfortunately, flying cars represent the technological apotheosis of sprawl and an attempt to eradicate distance as a fact of life for elites who are wealthy enough to routinely let slip the bonds of gravity. The report made it clear. Well, back in the 50s, prototypes like the Convair car placed the flying car in the streets of a typical American suburb with the promise of an airplane in every garage. The technological realities of a real flying car would make the sticker price of any fully realized vehicle well beyond the reach of all but the wealthiest buyers. I think that's totally, totally true. Yeah, where's the Model 3 of airplane cars? Model 3s aren't even cheap. Yeah. 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 Not to talk yeah. about Musk again, so we won't. Meanwhile, dozens of companies are looking to get a slice of the $850 billion vapor flavored pie. <laughs> While companies like Airbus and Boeing have launched their own flying car projects, the German startup company Lilium is the independent company getting the most buzz at the moment. Lilium is far beyond the drawing on a napkin stage of development. The company boasts over 300 employees and massive financial commitments from angel investors who trust Lilium to give them their literal wings. I thought you were going to say it boasts over 300 napkin drawings. <laughs> <laughs> Are we a flying car company or a napkin drawing company? <laughs> Sometimes I can't tell. Hey, I want to give a big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Do y'all know that Valvoline is the original motor oil? I'm not making that up. They've been around for like over 150 years now and they haven't stopped innovating. They've continued to innovate in the motor oil industry since then, which is amazing. Some of the stuff they've innovated are like the first high mileage motor oil, the first synthetic blend oil, and the first racing oil. That's pretty cool. And since then, they haven't stopped innovating. They're constantly reinventing their formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every single engine on the road. In fact, every single motor oil that Valvoline offers has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. It's proven to maximize engine life by targeting the four main causes of engine breakdown. What are those, you ask? Well, they are heat, friction, wear, and deposits. And another reason we love Valvoline, they're synonymous with some of the best racing legends of the last 100 years. Talking Cale Yarborough, AJ Foyt, Chase Elliott, the new NASCAR champ, Mark Martin, our friend Chris Forsberg, doesn't get much better than that. So do yourself a favor and choose Valvoline for your next oil change. Head over to valvoline.com slash original to find the right oil for your car or truck, whatever you have. Valvoline's got it. And a big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode. Lilium's business model is based on developing a fleet of flying taxis, not so much a car as a vehicle that can take off and land anywhere. Two sets of wings, smooth on top and serrated on the bottom like the edge of a saw, contain 36 small engines that can subtly control the prototype, kind of like a jetpack or a lunar landing module. The Lilium prototype is strikingly futuristic. The company's goal is to be transporting paying customers by 2025, en route to becoming an Uber for the skies. Speaking of Uber for the skies, that's actually a thing. The rideshare company attracted huge headlines when they announced their Uber Elevate project in 2018, along with a multi-propellered prototype. I remember this. Developed in conjunction with Hyundai that resembles a cross between a drone and a helicopter. Like Lilium, the concept for Uber was for air taxis that could provide one-time rides to passengers. However, hit hard by COVID in the past year, Uber offloaded the project in December of 2020, selling it to Joby Aviation, which is based in California. Hi, I'm Joby. 
Hi, I'm Joby, and I take to the sky. <laughs> Wait, yep, why? <laughs> Uh, on the automotive side of things, in 2020, Toyota debuted its SkyDrive project, a tiny one-seater with eight propellers that the Japanese automaker claims to be the smallest electric VTOL ever made. Toyota claims the two-seater version will be ready by 2023, but there are plenty of skeptics. Tellingly, comments are turned off on the YouTube unveiling video uh, of the vehicle, which is never a good sign. It's hard to tell whether the burgeoning air taxi field is a promising industry or just the latest iteration of a fantastical bubble of accessible human flight that has spanned not decades or centuries, but millennia. Just as comic book superheroes serve as contemporary versions of the ancient gods, we now have a modern version of the Icarus myth, the flying car. It's a myth that simultaneously inspires and acts as a warning to those who would seek to transform it into reality. We dream of flight, but countless inventors and companies have been burned by flying too close to the burning sun of reality. Ooh. Look. And if that's not an albatross, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I got an albatross around my neck. <laughs> I don't okay. I don't want to be like a like a what would you call that? A Luddite? A skeptic? A skeptic. I think that this is a cool idea, like the idea of uh, being able to skip the boring drive or whatever, the long drive, the monotony, and just get there fast and also be in the, the sky, a great yeah. place to be, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a worthy goal. Um, but there are obviously a lot of uh, problems that we kind of already mentioned. Like yeah. what is going to happen? What happens if there's a crash in midair? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, who benefits the most from this? And just looking at that Lilium, Tech bros. yeah, looking at that Lilium project, which does fly, by the way, it, it looks more like a plane than a car. It's, it still has mm -hmm. a huge wingspan. It needs yeah. a it needs like an airport to take off. It's a great first step, and I definitely don't like. I don't want to like discourage them or talk shit because like it's it's really cool. Um, I don't know. There's still just a lot of steps to get to that point where it's like where a city could be like to borrow an example from Star Wars, Coruscant, you know, where like all the all the cars are flying around on these different skyways and stuff like that, or like Blade Runner yeah. in that regard. Um, I, I don't know, I think. I don't think that's ever gonna happen. I mean, even like the Uber taxi looks like an airplane. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I think, I think the most feasible version of this is like a, a drone looking thing that can take off straight up and then just like you know, eventually turn its propellers to be facing yeah. forward and then turn into a plane because there's no, there's never going to be enough runway yeah. for this to be viable in a city. That's, that's essentially what the Lilium project is. If you go take a look at their page, like it's, it's, it's got a uh, pretty interesting wing layout, but they've got a bunch of motors on the wings and it, it, yeah. it uses them to take off vertically. And then the, the motors turn forward to, to yeah. go forward. So I could see this becoming a thing, mm -hmm. but absolutely. Do I think that people are going to get into their flying car and drive yeah. on a sky highway to work? No. Am I going to take my money out of GME and put it into Joby? No. <laughs> <laughs> but do I, I do think that, you know, that in the relatively near future, there will be a drone that shows up to your house and you get in it and it takes you somewhere. I could see that. I think what, just like there'll be a drone that like brings you Taco Bell. Ooh. Or brings, <laughs> yeah. you, brings you some frozen bean burritos. The El Monterey drone coming soon. Um, I mean, KFC made a gaming console. I could see Taco Bell coming out with a little like drone be great that marketing. drops off tacos. Mm -hmm. I think the main hiccup right now is that like there needs to be a next jump in like propulsion technology for like the, yeah. the car sized pilotable craft to happen it's going to need like some sort of like who like sci-fi quantum hover yeah. system you know for, for this sure. to, yeah. to for this to take off otherwise we we need to rely on wings and fan and turbo fans and stuff like that i i remember something about quantum propulsion uh in the news just in the last month so maybe they're getting there maybe who knows hopefully in our lifetime something like that happens but i also don't want me driving a flying car no. there's very few people i know that i would want driving a flying car out of people at donut who would you trust to fly a flying car that's a good question jesse only jesse oh, jesse, jesse for sure jesse for sure maybe, maybe job 
I think Jeremiah, Jeremiah for sure. Yeah, definitely not Eddie. <laughs> no, definitely not Eddie. Bridget. Bridget. I trust Bridget. Bridget. Probably. Yeah. Bridget and Jesse, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that just about does it for today's episode. I learned a lot. I'm very excited about, you know, the possibilities. Air taxis. Definitely looking forward to that Taco Bell drone. That's for sure. Yeah. Taco Bell drone. Uh, as drone. always, if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend. Let's tell a friend. Please subscribe. It just makes it easier for you to listen to it. It'll just pop up on your app. All right. I'm James Pumphrey. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and Dispo and Clubhouse. That's right. <laughs> oh, God. At James Pumphrey. <laughs> I'm Joe Weber. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok at Joe G Weber. And uh, most importantly, follow our co-host and uh, <laughs> pilot of this show, Nolan J. Sykes. Thank you. Yeah, follow me on, on I'm on TikTok now, but I probably missed that wave. Thanks to Bridget and Tommy, our producers. Uh, take care of yourselves. Yeah. I love you. And, you know, Nolan... Take care of yourself, dude. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, thank you. <laughs> Joe, uh, take care of yourself. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep it juiced!